Hey there, so today is going to be a little bit longer video because there's a lot of topics that need covering. I'm going to set up chapters, please use those. And I want to today just quickly cover the tactical aspects because I want to again stress that while it is important to know how the offensive is going, it is not as important to understand uh, why Ukraine is winning this war. And I want to focus a little bit more about what makes us sure that Ukraine is coming uh, at the end of this war as a victorious state and what's the situation around it. Let's start by covering the tactical situation on the Kherson area. Uh, Ukraine is trying to solidify the gains that it did. Uh, I have been receiving reports that Alexandrovka is contested, so potentially Ukrainians will be able to capture it soon enough. As far as I'm aware, Tsernovipoda and Lyubimirovka are under Ukrainian control, and I know that Zelenikhai is right now contested. The rest is about as we know. Uh, Soldatsky and Pravidne, there has been reports that it's been t captured by Ukrainians, but uh, it's not confirmed right now. The biggest gains that Ukraine has is around the central area here, and this is where they're pushing further, actually. So we know that David of Brit was contested, and it still is. Uh, but we know that Ukraine advanced further, taking Kostromka, and now pushing, and some people are even saying that already taking Shaslive, and it's actually pushing towards the south. So they are going deeper and uh, trying to cut this, uh, this uh, Russian-controlled territory, and maybe move closer towards Novokakovka. On this northern front, Arhangelsk, as far as I'm aware, is mostly controlled by the Ukrainians and they're pushing south, but they're still fighting uh, close and around the city. Uh, Olkhina Vysokopilia is also very contested because Russians actually pushed with reinforcements and tried to retake those. And a little bit of changes around uh, this area here. We know that Petrivka and Miralubivka, some reports are saying that it's contested, but there are already some reports that are saying that they've been taken by the Ukrainians. So I'm going to say that they're contested for now, but this is what we know. So that's that's about the tactical situation. But I really want us to uh, take a st step back and uh, let's talk about the war in general. Because all, having all these tactical maps and so on is really nice. And there's plenty of channels that are linked on my channel main page that go more in depth about uh, what is happening on a tactical level, where the specific units are moving. This is not the purpose that I'm here for. I'm here to explain how is Ukraine winning this war. And obviously war is not just won by uh, taking some villages. Uh, well, one might say that it's a step-by-step -step process, but uh, we need to understand that gaining or losing a village here and there will not win us the war. Some videos ago, I explained to you that we are looking at two numbers that Russians should be getting. One number was 1,000, and the other number was 60. So the 1,000 was 1,000 Russian soldiers that are uh, killed or wounded per day. At that moment, we know that the capacity of Russian to reinforce those forces are not going to be able to sustain that kind of damage, and therefore Russians will start actually losing. And then the second one, the 60, was the price of oil uh, that we were looking, the Brent brand oil, because at that price, the economic situation in Russia will start degrading very rapidly, and Russia will not have uh, a lot of the resources to support the economy as strongly as it's supporting it now, because right now most of the Russian economy is just burning through the stockpiled money that Russia has. And that's how they're plugging all the holes. And that's why it seems that, oh, Russia doing so fine. What I want, why I come back to this? Well, I want to congratulate you and say that with the Ukrainian offensive and now pushing towards the Russian lines and intensifying fire, Ukraine has reached the 1,000 men goal mark. So we can say with the start of this offensive and the intensifying of action right now, we are pretty much in the same uh, losses categories that where we were uh, around the uh, fighting in the Kiev area. So when at the start of the war, when Russians were killed and destroyed everywhere, this is about where we are. It's not the same level, but it's under 
but it's more that Russia can resupply itself with manpower. That means that Russians are starting to lose the war in a big sense. And right now, if we're talking territory, the biggest thing that I want to mention right now is this area here. This is where Piski and Avdiivka is, and probably this area here. So it's expected now more and more people agree that either here, here, or here is where the Russian new army corps that they got, 15,000 men, will come. So we should expect that there might be pushes coming towards Aparigia, more territory gained in this area, and maybe some territory will be gained in this area. Again, this is a potential scenario. I'm not saying this is what's going to be. But it's expected that the forces will reinforce those directions, and especially Piski, because it's a very, very... Uh, difficult situation for Ukrainians over there and a lot of the casualties that Ukraine is still sustaining are mostly coming from the, that uh, region. Important to know if we're coming back to Kherson is that our good friend the Bayraktar has come back so we can safely say that Ukraine does indeed uh, have some kind of air dominance maybe local but we know that the Bayraktars are flying in and they are destroying a lot of assets and it's an amazing so we're going to have a lot of the pretty footage of destroyed russian assets this is great russia is sending some more troops to kherson region we've had reports that there is a huge essentially convoy and basically not convoy but the flow of uh, of material that goes from through the crimea towards uh, kherson and apparently they really want to get them in um i'm not sure why uh, because Anyone with half a brain and just looking at the pictures and there's actual satellite images where there's like actually long queues of cars trying to get on the ferries to get across the Dnipro River, that is not a sustainable support line, right? We always need to understand that right now the biggest enemy of uh, Russians in Kherson region is not Ukrainian forces. I mean, yes, it is, but the biggest damage that's going to be dealt to them is attrition. So it's not going to be because the Ukrainians are going to kill every single Russian. It's probably because they're going to starve them out. So we know that there has been uh, this, con not convoy, but this flow of trucks. And there, around this area, there has been actually, it has been intercepted some, sometimes. And uh, there's actually quite big devastation that was reported in this area. So it's not going to stop the whole flow, but it's a nice feel-good knowledge that a part of those ammunition and equipment that is coming into it is being destroyed you also on the way another story that was not that long ago was that ukraine was using a lot of uh, wooden HIMARS essentially so they made decoys of HIMARS where the HIMARS would drive to position to shoot and then ukrainians would just conveniently leave wooden decoys with russian you know we've seen a lot of videos from the russian drones and their uh, quality of the picture that they're receiving is extremely poor if you even look at the videos that the Russian Ministry of Defense is putting out, the quality in those videos are atrocious for 21st century. So having a wooden decoy that's just barely colored green and it's located exactly where the Heimer is just shot at from. And uh, they've been able to lure out a lot of the expensive missiles, like precision target missiles, because Russia is running, running low on precision weaponry. So if they want to strike some kind of target with good enough precision... They need to use a very expensive and very limited piece of equipment to do that. Now, bridges in Kherson, as I said, most of them are destroyed. And we know for sure that most of the supplies are not coming through the bridges anymore. I think the most important thing that, that I, I've been trying to convey this message over the couple of videos. And especially now with the discussion, we know that a lot of propaganda uh, are basically saying that Ukraine has... Uh, failed in a counteroffensive that Ukraine has has already lost 10,000, 15,000 sometimes, like, I don't know, basically, well, however, however many people. But I think what we know, what we need to understand and come kind of take a step back is that we came from Russians saying we're going to take Kiev in three days and then within a week Ukraine is going to be captured. This was the narrative when they started this war. And now 190, I believe, 1 or 192 days in to the war, we are talking about, hey, by the way, this Ukrainian offensive, it's going on slowly and Ukraine is pushing the Russians out some places. We saw that the Russian Federation is not as scary as it's being painted on. I mean, to some, there are still a lot of European politicians that are still uh, bowing their heads to almighty great strategist, uh, master strategist, as Dart Putin puts it. 
most of the people now saw that the Russia was very much reliant on whatever Soviet legacy they had and on their own they don't really have that much to offer. And Ukraine is, is pushing back and Ukraine is attacking and we see that the Russian machine is failing and I hope that we will see that more of that in the coming days. But Ru Russian propaganda is, is actually completely, completely hilarious. Uh, so we know that the governor of, uh, well, not this area, it's actually the whole Kherson area, the governor they put in, Stremousov, he actually made video about that the Ukrainian offensive is going so poorly. The problem is he made that video in a hotel and people were able to geolocate that uh, image and it, he was actually in the Russian city of Voronezh, which is quite far away from Ukrainian front lines and especially from this region. So it's hilarious to know that, that the person that's supposed to be in charge of this region is actually stating that everything is fine, don't worry, while being uh, in Russia. Another hilarious thing that Russians are doing a lot, especially on Twitter. I mean, Twitter is a complete garbage uh, dump right now in the, coming, in the last days because Russians are not holding back with the money, I guess, to pay a lot of the bot armies and troll armies. And there is plenty of useful idiots uh, in, in, in different countries in the world that are ready to share any kind of propaganda, no matter how stupid it is. But what they're doing right now is they're doing the Uno reverse cards, basically, well, that's what I'm feeling. It. They're taking the videos that, for example, were posted by the Ukrainian army, uh, by, by, by any kind of verified sources, and then they're taking them and then they're putting them in the, in the messages and tweets and saying, haha, Ukrainian depot has now been exploded in the Kherson region, take that. And that's obviously hilarious because we know that Ukraine doesn't have huge stockpiles of ammunition. Ukraine has been very attritioned on the ammunition and uh, and material. We know that there is more manpower in Ukraine than material. So all of the ammunition, all of the material instantly goes to the front line. So there is no big stockpiles. Another uh, interesting propaganda was around the area of Enerhodar, it was during the International Atomic Energy Agency, I think it was, uh, during their visit to Enerhodar, they say that there was a Ukrainian Spetsnaz that was sent to capture Enerhodar. And, and I shit you not, they say it was 60 men on a boat that, were, that arrived to Enerhodar, uh, and then they were destroyed, captured, and there is apparently even some kind of footage that doesn't really show anything. But the point is, <laughs> Ukrainians capture the, the, the city essentially inside of enemy lines with 60 people on a couple of boats. It's like, it's beyond stupid. Like, I don't, I'm not, I'm, I'm completely unsure for whom this is made. And, and it, interestingly enough, some of the members of that uh, International Atomic Energy Agency, uh, they actually somewhat believed it because they heard some gunshots uh, from, from afar. Hilarious, hilariously stupid. And then another one, uh, I'm, I'm, I don't know if you've seen this one, but there is a video where this uh, uh, Russian propagandist, uh, they're doing the tour around the Enerhodar uh, power station, the nuclear power station, and there is a missile and the physicists like that are checking this area out says like, hey, why does the shell look like that it ca came in to this location that it was sh uh, shot essentially from the south, so from the Russian-controlled territory, because we know that Russia has been shelling in uh, all these days, and you ask, why, why would they shell themselves? Yeah, they, they were never shelling themselves. We know that they, the people around the town are talking that they know when the shelling will happen and where the essentially the shelling will occur, so they never got any damaged. It was just stuff that was blowing out in a field not that far from the nuclear power station. There was no casualties from the Russians, so we know that Ukrainians always just shell random fields and not the, for example, big ammo dumps, right? So the, these uh, physicists, they ask, oh, but how come the shell, it looks like that it came in from the south? And then the guy that is leading the Russian side, he's like, oh, no, 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 this is normal for the shells. So like when they fly in, you know, they, 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 they do a 180, from from where they flew in so the tail of the of this 
of this ammunition is actually uh, showing that it's actually flew from the north side and then it kind of like did a 180 in the ground and then uh, it now looks like that it flew from the south but it, it didn't and like people on the i a e a are kind of like yeah 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 thank you thank you for explaining this so what this conflict has shown for the most part is that all these organizations united nations red cross the the other ones they are almost completely useless when when we are getting the situation they don't have the leverage and the worst part is because they have this neutrality uh, presumption or or something they have this people with the mindset of neutrality either in charge on a lot of their commissions they are treating what what obviously lied when they're getting obviously lied to by one of the sides of the conflict for example because they need to be having this mentality of neutrality they still believe some of the things they're saying or or questioning it despite how stupid they are and we saw that whatever they're saying they they are not delivering right united nations is not stopping the war in ukraine right because there is a there is a member of the permanent member of security council that is just waging a biggest war in europe and killing hundreds of thousands of people they are not sending any action not, not trying to uh, say safeguard maybe the vulnerable people population they're not enforcing the geneva convention rules that un supposedly should do but it does and uh, then there is then there is the red cross that was supposed to uh, protect the the safety of the Azovstal troops as they were captured because that was agreement and then it's like no 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 that was never the case like we said that we're gonna make them safe at the moment when they surrender and th that's it the, after that we, we we cannot we cannot do anything so it's a it was a complete bullshit back then and then now we have the uh, atomic uh, energy agency and the biggest thing that we were expecting is they're gonna shut it down or at least make it make a suggestion that it should be a demilitarized zone around the nuclear power station but we're not hearing that basically they achieved nothing they came in to look at the pretty shells uh, then do a 180 turn and then come back to europe and make a report neutral report very neutral report saying well we saw stuff of shelling it could have been russia it could have been ukraine who knows but both sides should exercise caution bullshit like that uh, let's let's go to the next topic that we have and that is the us and eu relationship with russia because that is something that is a big pain point and russia a surprise to absolutely no one closes the Nord stream and supply of gas to you once again and everyone is feeling surprised but they also state that we should try to keep uh negotiation with russia going i'm not gonna tell you who said that a, you can Google it yourself, and B, I think it's pretty clear who might that be. It's funny. Russia is so in line to essentially damage the EU, but people in the EU and the politicians in the EU still have this like, no, 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 we, it's going to be fine. Russia is a trustworthy partner. Let's let's just let's just find a peace solution. And I think the best of this is being uh, shown by. A, this tweet you know on twitter right now there is a trend that's been set up essentially like instead of for a tweet you describe kind of the main message of what what's your core ideology or or something and like organization and people are doing this this was the best one because it described like what ukraine strives for and what germany strives for and i don't think i need to comment this much more it's kind of self-evident where's the irony in this the good news is though is that the biden is requesting to get another 18.7 billion dollars in lethal aid to ukraine which is great the question is if it's going to be a single package deal or it's going to be as before drip feeded month by month slowly 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 saturating the ukrainian forces i really hope that it's going to be a bigger package right now because ukraine they are in a position to receive a lot of the stuff let's quickly touch on some russian internal news so we know that the good interesting funny story is that russians are trying to recruit some homeless people in st petersburg to join the war effort in ukraine which is i mean it just shows just how big of a problem russians have with their military and uh, they are getting desperately close to start calling in mobilization and i want to talk about the mobilization a little bit because it's a, it's a boogeyman that's been described a lot firstly we have received like there are people that counted essentially how many tanks for example russia has 
and they don't have nearly as the same number of tanks that they are reporting because there, there are some reports saying that Russia has 20,000 tanks. But the, when some people actually counted, it turns out that's more closer to six. And now Ukraine is apparently reported destroyed around 2,000 tanks. We need to talk about the mobilization because while mobilization is important and it will get the troops, there is two very key problems that Russia will have with mobilization. First thing is that the, there is not that big number of instructors that can train the Russian forces. We already know that this third army corps is getting to the front lines. They barely got any training. They got very, very basic training, uh, basic operations with uh, some of the equipment and they are now being set, uh, sent to the front lines right away. If Russia mobilizes, it can mobilize a lot of the grunts which will be even worsely trained, while these people in the Third Army Corps was the most selected that people would have maybe some background in military. When we go into general mobilization, it's going to be people that a lot of times did not have any military experience. And secondly, it does not resolve the main uh, issue that Russia is having, is that they don't have a lot of specialists in their forces. You cannot mobilize and just receive great communications or a great engineer or a great commander anyone that anything that requires multiple years of experience and learning and actual combat prowess mobilization does not solve that problem what it does have though is is a ability to kill even more oligarchs so we know that putin's oligarchs are very much afraid of him, of him because they still think that uh, he can kill them and he does he does indeed kill them that's why there is no resistance in russia and some people are also because there was a like a I think it was the director or some kind of like an oligarch, it doesn't really matter to be honest, that was a little bit critical of the Putin and then, oh no, he randomly fell out of the window from, from I believe it was in hospital somewhere. The important part is that uh, right now in Russian society, there is still a lot of support for this operation. Like there, some polls are even saying that it's up to 70% or something. And then secondly, is that the Russian society is still very passive. I talked a lot about this uh, Russian opposition that uh, blew up supposedly Daria Dugina, but as we can see, it's not that it's happening on some kind of a constant basis. It was a single event, single assassination. It doesn't seem that there is significant opposition in Russia yet. All in all, we know that Ukraine is doing great. They have the air control, Bayraktars are wreaking havoc. It's going to be a very, very bloody couple of months for the Russians. Support Ukraine. See you next time.